all these kinds of questions, first of all, was what Turing showed that they can't be solved. Uh, one very famous question of that sort is the so-called halting problem, um, which Turing didn't actually deal with in that paper. But um, that's the kind of thing that you'll see in a textbook presentation. The halting problem is simply the question of, uh, right, is there a Turing machine uh, which, given as input, the code of another Turing machine plus some other input tells you whether the Turing machine with that code started on that input eventually halts or not. And that problem is also unsolvable. So, uh, so these are unsolvable problems, and Turing was one of the um, first to, to show that there are unsolvable problems of that sort. And I'll try now to give you an idea of how that can be done. Um, this is actually one of two proofs uh, in the paper that uh, Turing gives um, to show that um, the question of whether there is a circle free Turing machine uh, is um, that that problem is unsolvable. And those of you who know about the, um, the diagonal method or the diagonal proof that shows that um, the set of real numbers is not, uh, is not enumerable, uh, we'll see uh, that there is a certain uh, there's a close similarity between this first um, proof by Turing and that other proof. Okay, so here's the proof. Um, suppose we could, uh, uh, suppose we could, well, first of all, we can list all the natural numbers, right? Um, now, among all the natural numbers, there are some numbers that are codes of Turing machines. And among these codes of Turing machines, there are some that uh, are Turing uh, codes of Turing machines which actually compute computable numbers, so which in, uh, write 0 and 1 infinitely often on its tape. So let's list all of those and let's um, leave out all the ones that don't actually compute computable numbers. Okay? Um, so uh, let this sequence of uh, numbers ki be the sequence of codes of Turing machines which compute computable numbers. All of them, right? All the Turing machines which compute computable numbers. Each one of them, right, so each ki is the code of a Turing machine, and that Turing machine computes some number between 0 and 1. Uh, let's call that number alpha i, right? So alpha i is the number computed by a Turing machine with code ki. And then let the jth digit of alpha i, let's write that alpha i, alpha sub i of j, that's the jth digit of, I, uh, of alpha i. And now we can define a, a number beta, um, which you get by taking, um, uh, uh, by, uh, by taking as its jth digit, 1 minus alpha ij. Okay? Uh, now what does that look like? It's easier to see if you have a picture, right? So suppose, uh, suppose this is how our list of, um, of alpha starts, right? So, K1 is the code of a Turing machine which computes alpha 1. Um, and suppose the first Turing machine in, uh, in our list just computes the number 0, right? So it just keeps on printing 0 and doesn't do anything very interesting, right? And then the second Turing machine uh, computes the number alpha 2. Um, that might be the number 0 0.1, 1, 1, 1, 1, and so on. Um, and then the third Turing machine, that computes the number one third, right, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, and so on, et cetera, et cetera, right? And suppose that is a list of all the computable numbers, right? So we've gotten this list of computable numbers by listing all the codes of Turing machines which compute computable numbers. And then let beta be that number at the very bottom, which we get by looking at all the red digits and changing zeros into ones and ones into zeros. Okay, so I've defined a real number between zero and one by giving you a binary expansion of that number, and that number doesn't show up on the list that I had, right? Why? Because in the first digit, it's different from alpha one, so it can't be alpha one. In the second digit, it's different from alpha two, so it can't be alpha two. In the third digit, it's different from alpha three, so it can't be alpha three, and so on. So it's none of these, right? But those were all the, the computable numbers. So that means that beta can't be a computable number. So we've constructed a number, a, a number beta, which isn't computable, okay? On the other hand, uh, 
can't I, right? I mean, I have this list of the, of the codes of Turing machines, and I have the universal Turing machine. So why can't I compute um, this number beta just by you know, looking at the, at the code of the first Turing machine and running it until it's produced its first digit, and then flip that and write that down, and then take the, sec the code of the second Turing machine and use the universal Turing machine to run that until it's produced the second, its second digit, and then flip that and write that down, that will be the second digit of beta, and so on. Right? So that seems like it's a computable procedure, and if, the, if there's a universal Turing machine, why isn't there a Turing machine that does that? A Turing machine that computes beta. Right? So it looks like we have a paradox, but it's only an apparent paradox, because in order to get that list of codes of Turing machines, that compute numbers, we first, right, in the first, in the very first step, we have to uh, leave out all those codes of Turing machines that don't compute numbers. And how could we do that unless we had some kind of test for uh, figuring out whether a given code of a Turing machine computes a computable number or doesn't, right? And in fact, if we had such a test, if there were a Turing machine which could tell you, given the code of a Turing machine, whether it's the code of a Turing machine that computes a number, which writes an infinite number of zeros and ones on its tape, right? then we could compute beta. But because beta was constructed in such a way to guarantee that it's none of the computable numbers, uh, there can't be such a Turing machine, because beta can't be computed. Okay, So that's um, Turing's first proof. Um, to show that there can't be a Turing machine C which decides the question of whether a code of a Turing machine given to C as input is the code of a so-called circle-free Turing machine, one that computes, uh, that writes an infinite number of zeros and ones on its table. Okay, so here we have an example of a relatively simple proof of undecidability of a question about Turing machines, namely the question whether a Turing machine is circle free. I mentioned another one which Turing also proves the question of whether um, there is, uh, whether a Turing machine eventually writes the symbol zero on its tape, right? That is also an undecidable question. 